Welcome to this bonus episode of Strategy Simplified. This episode is a recording of a live communication workshop our team held this week. If you're ready to take the clarity and impact of your communication to the next level, then pull out a notepad and pen as you listen along. We talk about how to increase the clarity, impact, and influence of your presentations, your meetings, and your emails. If you like what you hear, join us this upcoming Wednesday for a communication bootcamp. This bootcamp is a three hour deep dive into the framework known as the Pyramid Principle. It's what made McKinsey, McKinsey. You can learn more through the link in the show notes. As an added bonus, after next week's bootcamp, everyone who attends will get a one-on-one working session with a management consultant instructor. That session will be for us to take an even deeper dive into a presentation you're working on, an email you're writing, or just in general, your work product. All right, without further ado, let's dive in. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's session uh, on how to be an impactful communicator. We're really, really excited for you to join us. Uh, We've got a ton of folks that are entering the waiting room, getting situated, uh, getting on camera, getting their mic set up. So we've just got one little housekeeping announcement uh, before we get started. This is going to be a fast paced hour. Uh, And so if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat as we go throughout today. Feel free to raise your Zoom hand. We will have a couple of dedicated times in the session today to answer questions. Uh, One about halfway through, and then we're going to leave about five to 10 minutes at the end to answer questions as well. So you can feel free to pop them in the chat as you think of them. We're not ignoring you if we don't answer it right away. Uh, We'll try to get to as many as we can during the the predefined Q&A times. Uh, Stephanie and I, my colleague and our chief learning officer, we're going to be walking you through today, uh, and we're going to be doing a longer version of this training next week. So today, we just barely get to skim the surface on on pyramid principle, which is our preferred approach to be an impactful communicator. We're doing a three-hour training next week uh, where we get to go into breakout rooms. We get to do exercises where you get a one-on-one session with either her or I after uh, that workshop as well. Uh, And so if you end up purchasing a ticket while you're on the call today, we're going to give you a hundred bucks off just for saying thank you for joining us live. So uh, you can learn more by clicking on the link in the chat, by scanning the QR code, using the the coupon code that's on the slide here. Uh, Our colleague Japheth will pop it in the chat as well. Again, there's no pressure at all, but we know that we are not going to be able to get anywhere near uh, kind of full depth or comprehension in this hour. Uh, And we're going to get a lot further into pyramid principle and impactful communication when it comes to your presentations, uh, your meetings, and your emails next week. So if you like what you hear today, if you find it helpful, if you like hanging out with us, uh, then for the next 60 to 75 minutes while we're on the call, this coupon code is active. Uh, and so you'll be able to get a hundred bucks off and, and come next week. Uh, and you'll get a one-on-one with, with uh, one of us as well. It'll be a working session where we'll work through one of uh, a presentation that you're currently working on right now. Uh, and so that's going to be a lot of fun. We always love doing those. Uh, so in the Q&A times, if you have questions about next week, as well as about what we're talking about today, uh, then feel free to, to ask those questions at that time. Okay. We've kind of got the housekeeping out of the way. We've got a quorum here. Uh, We're excited to dive in. And and here's our definition of impactful communication. It's captivating your audience by telling persuasive stories. That's really the crux of of this evening session. And our assertion, our key takeaway for you, if you hear nothing else today, like here's the nugget for you right now. Effective communication starts with an assertion. And, And an assertion is a key takeaway. It's what you want your audience to do or believe by the end of their time with you. And and here's our assertion, that if you employ a pyramidal communication structure, you will become a more effective advisor and leader. And here's why. You're going to make your key takeaways clearer and easier to understand for your audience. Employing the structure is going to help you emphasize the most important actions to take, either for your audience or for you. And it's going to increase the engagement of your presentations by moving you from communicating just information to communicating insights. And so if you hear nothing else today, hear this. Effective communication starts with an assertion. And here's why it's good for your stakeholders, the people that you're communicating with. It's going to make it easier for them to stay engaged. 
Stop me if you've been in a meeting like this. Someone walks in and they give you 30 minutes of context, minute detail, process-oriented information that just doesn't matter to you or that you don't need to know. And you've fallen asleep by the time they finally get around to the punchline. I think all of us have sat in meetings like that. Um, in our organization, we're eliminating meetings like that because I hate them, Stephanie hates them, uh, and we don't have to have an environment like that. It's ineffective, it wastes time, and it doesn't empower our people either, right? You, you're empowered, uh, you either empower your team or you empower yourself when you use this kind of communication structure. So it's gonna make it easier for your audience to stay engaged. It's gonna increase their understanding of what matters because you're leading with it right? You're not burying the punchline. You have our permission to, to end with the punchline if you are leading a comedy set at a nightclub, right? <laughs> if you have a Netflix special, then you can end with the punchline. But in business communication, uh, lead with the punchline. There's no reason for you to bury the lead. Finally, it's going to help your audience act on the data and the insights that you are bringing them. Uh, and again, we've talked about why that's the case. This is also going to be good for you. Here's why. It's going to increase your influence. I, I, I've already kind of preview this both ex with external stakeholders, with internal stakeholders, you are going to take an advisory stance with your clients, with your superiors, with your colleagues, because you're going to be leading with the key takeaway. It's going to make your asks clearer as well, right? Stop me if you've, if you've experienced this before, where you've been in a meeting, uh, you've, you've made a request for something, but you're not clear about it because it's buried in a hundred slide deck. It comes at the, in minute 28 of a 30 minute meeting and no one has the ability or the time to make a decision uh, in that two minute span, right? So if you lead with your asks, it'll make them clearer and it'll help you get what you need when you need it. Either, whether it's budget, whether it's headcount, whether it's uh, closing a sale, whether you're just asking someone for a time to meet. Um, if your asks are clearer, um, you'll get more often what you're asking for. Uh, and then finally, this is going to speed up your work process and your debt creation process, because what we're going to encourage you to do today, I was going to say force, we're not going to force you, what we're going to encourage you to do today uh, is to storyboard and plan out your, your communication before you ever write a single word or before you ever build a single slide. And so if you think through ahead of time, what is my assertion? What is my main recommendation, goal, or idea? What are my supporting arguments? And then what is the curated data that backs those up? If you think of that structure ahead of time and then fill in the language, the slides at the end, you're gonna save yourself a whole lot of time. Uh, and Stephanie, you were at McKinsey. This is kind of like, this is what turned McKinsey from the world's premier analytics firm to the world's premier advisory firm. Can you just give us a little bit more insight into what this is? It's called the pyramid principle, but can you just break it down for us? Yeah, so we, we start off the top and we start strongly and clearly with one main idea. We've already heard Naman call that the assertion. That's the language we're going to be using. Um, now, that assertion, we can't just pull an idea out of thin air. It has to be backed up and supported. We're going to choose a select curated set of supporting arguments to be able to back up and prove out that assertion. And then each of those arguments themselves need to be supported, utilizing data insights and our conclusions. This top-down approach not only makes our main points clear, but makes sure that we're only including the information that's necessary to be able to build and prove the story that we want to tell. We'll be right back after this quick break. Have you ever heard a new digital trend and thought to yourself, okay, does this really matter? Asking the right questions helps you cut through the noise and get down to what matters most. I'm Jim Hertzfeld, host of the What If So What podcast, where we discover what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real by asking what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Subscribe and listen, and together we can turn big ideas into tangible actions so you can get shit done. Yeah. And here's the thing. If the data says something else, then you can go back to the beginning and you can you can start with a different story. Right. But if the data validates your assertion or your story, which most of the time it will, because you're close to the information that you're working with, then you can move forward with creating your presentation, your piece of communication. And you present it and project it as if the data is telling the story because it is right. You just happen to start with that story ahead of time. So that's that's an Awesome breakdown, Stephanie. We've got a couple questions for y'all. We're curious, and, and Japheth, I, I think you may have to launch these polls, but have you heard of this approach before? 
let us know. Poll should be popping up in just a second, but we want to know if you've heard of it, uh, if you've used it, or if this is the first time you're ever hearing of the pyramid principle. And if you've used it before, if you have kind of war stories, either good or bad, uh, employing the pyramid principle, we want to hear about them as we move throughout today. I don't know if we're able to get that poll up or not. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we got it up, went ahead and closed it, now sharing it. We've got 48% saying, yes, we've heard of it. 23% saying, yes, we've used it. Okay. And 29% saying, no, haven't heard of it. Great to have those of you with us who have actually heard of and or used it before. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you'll pick up something new though today. Absolutely. And one more question for the group here. Where do you feel like your communication needs to improve the most? So when we work with, with our corporate partners, we find they communicate in three main ways, through presentations, through emails, and through meetings. Uh, and so there should be another poll popping up here right now. Where do you feel like you need the most improvement when it comes to the clarity of your communication? Uh, and we've got a plan to touch all three of these things today, but based on your responses here, we may linger a little bit more on one or two of these as opposed to another. We've got 60 responses. Leave it open for a couple more seconds. Okay, Naman, today with this group, we're seeing 53% say meetings, 33% say presentations, and 14% saying emails. And as okay. Naman alluded to, the, the pyramid principle is applicable in all of these formats. I love it. So my one of my assertions coming in today was that most of you were going to say presentations. And so it's already been proven wrong. And so we're just going to adjust on the fly. And we'll spend a little bit more time on meetings than we were planning to. That's why we have the poll. So thanks for, for letting us know. I'm going to go ahead and, and just for those of us who aren't familiar, just share a quick one slide overview of the pyramid principle. And we, we have to give, oops, we have to give props to Barbara Minto here. Okay. So Barbara was McKinsey's first post MBA female hire. Uh, in the 1970s, and she noticed something really interesting when she was in kind of interim and final meetings with clients. She she saw the eyes glazing over. She saw the yawns being stifled, right? She saw that that folks, that clients weren't engaging with McKinsey's recommendations the way that they wanted them to. And so she developed this structured approach to communication that was originally meant to help clarify McKinsey's written reports to move McKinsey's recommendation to the very beginning of the meeting, the very beginning of the report from the, from the back end. And like I said at the very top, this approach is what really helped McKinsey go from premier analytics firm to premier advisory firm and help them become advisors to their clients. Because now what was happening is they would lead with their recommendation, they would lead with their assertion, and clients, they looked at the rest of the the methodology, the rest of the reasons why McKinsey was making that recommendation through a different lens, because they knew for upfront what they were going to be asked to do. Uh, and so it engaged them in both a positive and negative way, right? You had champions in the room who said, yep, that's exactly what I, I thought we should do, or yep, that sounds good to me. Uh, and you also had folks in the room who, right, it raised their heckles. They had a negative reaction to whatever McKinsey's recommendation was. Both are wins for you when you use the pyramid principle. If you get a negative reaction early on, all your audience has done has told you what they care about. And then you can adjust on the fly, right? Instead of finding out in minute 29 of a 30 minute meeting, what your audience really cares about, what they don't agree with, uh, what they don't want to do when you have no more time left to fix it, to address it, to discuss it, you find out in minute three and you've still got 27 minutes now to adjust and have that conversation. So I want to encourage you all whether you get positive or negative feedback to your assertion, either one is a win. Stephanie, can you talk to us just about moving recommendations first, what this process looks like? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what we're used to is starting and talking through, here's the way that we thought about it, and here's all the data, and here's the insights that, and, that we came to. But when we, when, we, when we change our approach to a pyramid principle approach, we start with the clear, specific recommended action. Let me be really clear and upfront about this is what I want you to do. And Naman was clear with you today. What we want you to do is sign up for and be with us next week to talk about this even further, right? Um, we're going to back that up with, with the key insights that matter. 
Um, and, and by the time that we're done, kind of move to move to being really actionable, practical, pragmatic with next steps. And, you know, to speak to uh, Jacqueline's point in chat here real quick, you know, Naman was talking about being able to to stay focused and, and d- direct our conversation on the fly based on what we're hearing in the meeting. That doesn't always necessarily mean that in a meeting context, you're you're recreating quantitative charts and you're creating new pivot tables and new visual graphics as you go through uh, a 30 or 60 minute meeting and discussion, but that you come in really solidified and anchored to the main points that you want to get across and that you can direct the the conversation, you can help contribute to the conversation um, in that in that vein and towards that still recommended action. Um, and so you just want to comment on there briefly. Amazing. Stephanie, can you share your background of the pyramid principle? Like why are you talking to us about this today and, and what's your experience with it? Yeah, so my background is I've been in the management strategy consulting space for over 10 years now. Um, I and and even before that, I, I was in nonprofit, I was in nonprofit management doing a lot of fundraising and a lot of messaging and marketing. Um, in consulting, I moved, my first space was in at McKinsey, spent over four years at McKinsey. And on day one, we did a pyramid principle training. Uh, I didn't realize how much it was baked into the day in and day out work and the presentation style and tools and techniques um, until really I left the firm and I had to kind of operate within different working groups and different environments. Um, And so I have been really, really excited to join on here at Management Consulted to, um, you know, where they also kind of work within this space and really, um, really kind of holistically own it. And then within, uh, I teach graduate level classes at Duke University as well. And within each of my classes, this is something that we start with this top down approach. It's not only a communication tool, that's where Barbara Mento started, but it also has the opportunity to revolutionize our work process planning um, and our emails uh, and kind of all forms of more broadly speaking of communication and uh, delivery. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it certainly did that for me and more. Uh, so, hey, everyone, I'm Naman, CEO of Management Consulted. I started my career on Capitol Hill. And if any of you have ever seen a political ad, either willingly or not willingly, uh, you will you will very quickly realize that political strategists and, and communicators use the pyramid principle because they tell you right up front, hey, vote for me. Here's why. Don't vote for her or him. They are the devil incarnate, whatever. But you, you, you figure out in five seconds what the key message is, what the key takeaway is that they want you to get out of it. And that's the world that I cut my teeth in. Uh, and when I moved over to the nonprofit world and the development and fundraising, much like Stephanie did, then when I moved over into the private sector, the same approach helped me keep a focus on what was most important, not just in my communication, but as Stephanie mentioned, in my work process and planning as well, because I start every week and everything that I do with an assertion of of what I think needs to happen. And then I go try and find the data to prove that assertion. And I'm often wrong. That's okay. I then go back and I re-rejig my assertion. But it saves me so much time and keeps me hypothesis driven every day. Uh, And I'm just sold on this as a tool uh, for what makes a top performer a top performer. And so we're, we're evangelists for this, and we're really excited to be talking to you about it today. Uh, let's break down the three parts. I know Stephanie's already done that a little bit, but here's really what we're trying to get you to do here, is to structure your thought process before you start communicating, right? And she already broke down your main recommendation, starting with that, coming in with the, the supporting arguments. If you think of your main recommendation as the so what, If I'm your audience and I'm sitting in a presentation you're making, the first question that comes to my mind is, so what? Why do I care? What do you want me to do? Why am I here, right? That's your main recommendation, your goal or idea. My second question is why? Why should I do that? Why should I believe that? Why does that matter to me? And your supporting arguments are the answers to the hypothetical question, why? And they make up then the chapters of your story. They make up the sections of your presentation. And then the specific slides inside of those chapters, inside of those sections, are the supporting data that then reinforce those those arguments. Uh, And so that's really the the structure that we're recommending today. And practically, here's what it looks like. And and these are not 
like 100% hard and fast rules, but we're going to push you to stay to them today as we do some of these exercises. So first, your assertion. The pyramid principle is, is strange. The foundation is the top layer. It's not the bottom layer. Everything starts from the top. And so again, what are you meeting, presenting, writing about? Why does it matter? Explain it in 10 words. We've been doing this for over 10 years, and we found that if you can communicate your assertion in 10 words, it is crystallized, it is clear, it is distilled down to its very essence. And, and let me just say this, uh, I know this is gonna make Stephanie happy, right? If you are not using assertions today, if this is new to you, we would much rather you have a 50 word assertion than no assertion at all, right? So if you are using the primary principle and your assertions, your recommendations are 30 words, push yourself to get to 20 words by the end of today's session. Wherever we're at, we're gonna try and make a little bit of improvement, but best practice is, you should be able to explain it in 10 words, otherwise it's not clear enough yet. Underneath that, again, you've got your argument sections. These are the supporting rationale for that assertion. And these are articulated in, at most, for an hour long presentation, three to four sections, right? Any more than that, and you're rushing to get through slides, you don't have time for discussion, and the human brain can really only digest kind of three distinct ideas in, in a short time frame, anyways. Uh, and so three kind of sections to uh, an hour long deck, or if you're writing an email, structuring a meeting agenda, three to four bullet points that talk about why your assertion is your assertion. And then underneath Stephanie, do you wanna talk to us about these data slides? Uh, this is a shockingly low number. And and we're talking about kind of best practice principles and pairing it all the way back. I may go as far as to say, 10 to 20 data slides per, per hour. But after we are clear with the assertion that we wanna make, when we have properly supported it with the, the right arguments, um, then it should be very clear to us what data we need to put in front of our audience to be able to make those points. Yes, you have more data than that. Yes, you did more analysis than that. Yes, you have more thoughts than, than, than that. That all goes in the appendix. So we're talking about kind of what, what ends up and what lands in the main narrative deck, what you're going to work through with your audience, and, and what are you trying to get to? You're trying to prove out your assertion. That's your, your only goal of this 60-minute 60, 60 meeting, let's say then you should be able to craft a top-down story and only have maybe as few as 10 data slides during that entire hour. Let's practice this. At least let's practice the assertion. All right, again, the assertion, what we're meeting about or presenting about and at a high level, why it matters and target 10 words. So here's your, here's your scenario, okay? And we're all gonna do this together. So uh, we're gonna put a timer on here in a second, uh, gonna give you a minute and you're gonna type your assertion into chat, okay? So you are advising a cell phone cover manufacturer that is looking to increase profitability, okay? And here's some data that you have access to. And I won't read the three bullet points, everyone on this call can read hopefully. So I'll let you digest it for a few seconds. Uh, I'll put a minute and 20 seconds on the clock. Stephanie, if that sounds good to you, we'll let folks digest the information. Your job is to write a one 10 word ish assertion to recommend what your cell phone cover manufacturer client should do and why. All right, so we've, we've got a minute and a half ish on the clock. And then we'll we come back. This is and fast, but we don't have too much time with you today. So let's put it into practice and see what you can come up with. And if you're done with your assertion early, feel free to pop it into chat. This is good practice for coming up with a hypothesis before we look at all the information. Josh, you're on the right track. Make it a little bit more assertive. What should your client do? Mike, I like yours. 
it's missing the high level why at the end. You've got the what. So maintain the black, white, and blue colors while reducing the number of other colors, right? Maybe you add on the end of there, I know it's not 10 words, but to maximize profitability. Which is just what Natasha did. So love it. Love it. Stephanie, are you seeing any that's standing out to you? Yeah, we're seeing a bunch more come in right now. So, you know, to, to speak to what we've been calling out already, you know, we, we, want, we need that what and why components. We need both of those things. What should we do? Why should we do it? Now, to get that down to 10 words, it's most likely that you're going to start with an action verb. And it's most likely that you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna summarize here. You're going to have to. Um, Nija, similarly there, yeah. Focus on these colors to increase profits. Exactly. Yep. Um, and you know what? Um, maybe we don't know the exact why, right? Um, I, haven't, I haven't seen anybody yet put in a variable uh, or put in a placeholder, right? But when we think about even in the way that we we go about creating our recommendations, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna create my first draft of my recommendation early, and I'm gonna put in a placeholder. I'm gonna put in a variable, and then as I as I work to prove this out, I'm gonna figure out well what is what's the impact gonna be here because I I know that I want to be able to speak to the impact to my stakeholders to my audience. Yeah, so to increase profits by X percent, right? Mm -hmm. And then we know what we're going to go look for. Absolutely. Okay, I think we've got it. Now, one one thing I'm disappointed by is everyone seemed to have a similar assertion. I was hoping someone would come out of left field with a different <laughs> assertion because there are multiple assertions to be made from this data, right? It's not just telling us one thing, uh, but we don't have time today to, to dive into what, what some alternates could be. Uh, but I think you all are getting the idea. High level what and high level why in around 10 words. This is a great place to start uh, as you now look to build the rest of this presentation or to plan out the workflows for, for this project. Here's one of my favorite examples that really helped crystallize the pyramid principle for me. Okay, and maybe it's just because I'm a McDonald's lover, who knows? But, but non-pyramid principle, the non-pyramid principle approach to me is like going to McDonald's, right? When you walk into a McDonald's, you walk up to the counter and you see lots of menu options in front of you, right? You've got the Big Mac, you've got the fish fillet, you've got the chicken nuggets, you've got a million other things I can't remember right now, right? And, and you just, you stand there and you pick based on, on what looks good to you in the moment, right? What, whatever picture looks best to you is probably what you pick, right? Or what you always pick is probably what you pick, right? You don't ask the cashier behind the counter what he or she recommends at McDonald's. Hey, are the chicken nuggets good here? Like, is the, is the fish fillet good here? Like, they're not an advisor. They're a facilitator, okay? And because of that, the staff can be replaced by machines. It's already happening, right? Like, because they're not adding value as far as, they're not adding advisory value to the transaction, okay? And so you hold all the power as the consumer, right? Which is the same as in pyramid principle, but like, there's, there's no, no kind of, advising, there's no curation that's happening at McDonald's. You get everything thrown at you all at once and you just pick from the menu, okay? And there may be one recommended coursing, right? Do you want fries with that? That's probably the only recommended coursing that you get, but really, right, nothing like that is happening at McDonald's. Now compare that with a fine dining or Michelin star experience, right? You have limited menu options. You walk into the French Laundry in Napa Valley or wherever you like to go eat that's fancy, right? And, and there's a one-page menu, right? Hey, this is the chef's menu for the, for the evening. It's one page. These are our courses, right? We may have some substitutions for gluten-free or allergies, but the menu is the menu, right? Like this is what we're making tonight because these are the ingredients we could source. You still get to pick, right? You still get to order up the menu. You still hold the power. So... The restaurant isn't telling you, you have to eat this, but they're giving you a, a curated set of options to make your decision easier, right? There's less paralysis by analysis at a place like that. One of the reasons also is because your waiter or your waitress is an advisor, right? I ask my waitress, hey, if I order these six things for the table, like, will you bring them out in the order that they should be eaten? Hey, if I order this, what bottle of wine do you recommend? right? Like they are an, ad, an advisor and they enhance the experience because of their expertise, right? They, they 
add that necessary value to take the experience from being just about the food to about the interaction that you have with that waiter or waitress as well. So as you're building your presentations, as you're preparing for your meetings, as you're writing your emails, just think, how can I become more like a fine dining waiter or waitress, right? You are not telling your audience, this is your only option. You're not even telling them this is the answer. You're telling them, here's what I recommend that you do and here's why, right? You're, but you're making it easier for them to make a decision. You're also enhancing your own value in the process because you're setting yourself to, up to be an advisor, not just an analyst. And that's really one of the, the huge values of implementing pyramid principle in your day-to-day -day work is that you set yourself up to be an advisor, not just an analyst. And so this, this really helped crystallize pyramid principle for me uh, when, when I was learning it. And as we wrap up our, our just section on assertions, I wanna leave you with this, they work. How many of you are fans of the Princess Bride, right? <laughs> like, raise your Zoom hand if you are, right? Like, what does he say, right? Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die, right? That is an excellent demonstration of a clear assertion, right? Like right away, you know what he's about, right? What he wants you to get out of this interaction <laughs> and why it matters to him, right? And so uh, this is what you're aiming for in your presentations, maybe different language, hopefully different language, uh, but, but the same structure, right? <laughs> All right, let, let's get into how to apply this. Let's talk about your meetings. Let's talk about emails. Let's talk about presentations. So Stephanie, can you just break down for us quickly how this differs from the common approach that all of us came up with uh, in academia? We are so used to trying to go find all the things. Let's learn all the, let, let, me, let me collect all the data. Let's go out there and, and, and figure it all out. And then once, once I've learned all that, once I've found all the stuff, then let me figure out kind of what the main points are, right? And then, then maybe I'll kind of come to an overall conclusion. And, and this is a, this, this bottoms up approach, common approach, standard approach, it still makes sense when you want to prove your point with extensive support. So when you are uh, performing a clinical study, writing a doctoral thesis, you know, et cetera, these times when you have to include all the stuff and find all the stuff, absolutely go for it. Yet we're talking about the, the corporate world and we're talking about business communication. Our goal is not to prove a point with extensive 99.9% .9 inclusion. Uh, our goal is to gain buy-in and motivate actions from our key stakeholders, from your audience. And in this zone here on the right-hand side of the slide, this pyramid principle top-down approach, we need to start with, we need to start with our main point. That main point is going to be backed up by a limited curated set of arguments. And then those arguments are going to be proven out by select amounts of data. And that's, that should, as we fully embrace this process, it should reduce the amount of time it takes to create the same presentation. It should reduce the amount of time in our meeting to be able to get to the same main point. It should reduce the number of slides that we have. And so we've got some examples here, you know, towards that, towards the, that end. But we're moving from this bottoms up approach and now embracing this top down approach. I thought that was a great, great breakdown, Stephanie. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide uh, because a third of us said, you know, this is not really what we, we want to spend our time focusing on, but this is what it looks like as you're looking to make your presentations persuasive. It, it means being pyramid principle friendly means you start with your executive summary, right? At McKinsey, Bain, BCG, you write your executive summary on day one of the project. Uh, a lot of us write our executive summary as the last slide before we walk in to present, right? Because to us, it's the summary, right? You Don't you summarize at the end? Uh, not when you <laughs> take a pyramid principle approach. You, your executive summary includes your assertion and your arguments. That's what your executive summary is made up of. And that then defines for you the set number of slides that you're going to build and what they're going to correspond to. Okay. And then as you go to start building those slides and you find data that demands that you reshape your story, you go back to the executive summary, you adjust the assertion. It always happens. You adjust some of your arguments. It always happens. But then you... Now go try and prove or disprove that assertion. You now go and try and prove it or disprove those arguments. And it saves you time in the research and the analysis process 
And it also saves you time, as Stephanie mentioned, in the slide building process, because you're not building 100 slides that are all going to be presented, right? You are being intentional about the slides that you're going to go create. And so that's what a pyramid principle approach looks like when it comes to making your presentations persuasive and saving yourself time in the creation process as well. Stephanie, can you talk to us about what a good executive summary looks like for the folks that really did want to learn about presentations? Uh, and then mm -hmm. we'll, we'll move on to meetings and emails. Yeah, and and there'll be there'll be a good analogy here to meetings as well. So, um, you know, pay attention if that's your your key area too. But um, so we're talking about an executive summary coming up first in our communication. We're, we're talking about it being brief, direct, and clear in terms of what our main point is. Um, now, why why do we want it to be brief? Well, uh, look at this slide. If you look at the words on this slide, if you were to count them, um, then the words on the main body of the slide, that's right about 40 words, right about 40 words in terms of, um, you know, kind of a, a written document or, you know, think about a slide here, your audience has to decide whether or not in the, in the active moment of you being in a meeting or a presentation, am I going to read what's on the slide or am I going to actually listen to the presenter? There's a tipping point right about 40 words, right about the number of words on this slide, where anything less than 40, I can pretty, it, your audience will be able to pretty effectively uh, do both. I can read what's on the slide, I can digest what digest what's there, and I can listen to you. So we want to keep it, we want to keep our slide, all of our slides brief, including the executive summary. Um, executive summary up front is going to put out there for our audience what the main point is, why we're here, what we're trying to recommend, and the, and the key arguments that back it up. Uh, Naman alluded to this before. If, if that draws out key questions and objections from our audience, then we get to know about those things and redirect the conversation towards those elements off the top. We should see that as an opportunity, not a challenge. It allows us to focus our time where it really needs to be to be able to gain that alignment, gain that buy-in so that we have actionable next steps coming out of this meeting that we can move forward with. When you don't get to those objections and you don't get to the pushback until halfway through, two-thirds of the way through at the 11th hour, you know, before you're wrapping up, you're not able to actually address those and talk through those things. And you never, you don't leave with actionable next steps. So whether, whether it's constructing an executive summary or it's constructing a meeting agenda, you're using a similar set of principles here. You want to be very clear and upfront about what the main point is, about why you're meeting, what the recommendation is, of what we're trying to get out of this time. Be very specific, but, but also brief with the arguments that you have laid out and listed underneath that main assertion. And to be able to, to share that upfront with your audience. In a presentation, that takes the form of a, a slide, an executive summary that comes up front in the, in the conversation. And in a meeting context, it can, it can go out with your meeting invite. A meeting agenda written in the same form and format as an executive summary allows people to know what you're trying to get out of this meeting. And it, it, sets, the, it sets the arguments out in front of your audience early um, and allows you to focus the time on what it's going to take. What do we need to talk about to be able to get everybody on board here? So what we're going to do next week is we're going to go over your executive summaries or your meeting agendas, your emails. Uh, but for today, we'll just, we'll look at one that Bain put together years and years ago. All right. So let's take just 40 seconds here. Type in the chat. How would you make this better? Right. No other context except for that this was an executive summary for a pitch deck, okay? And so this is Bain's executive summary. Just take a look at it. What don't you like about it? How would you make it better just based on the conversation we've been having today? There's some good questions in chat that we'll get to as we go through. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing there's a theme here of too many words. Yep. What else? Bold characters and consistent, okay. Yeah, the focus on the client, Mike. Yep, it's pretty generic. I have no idea what the picture means. It doesn't correspond at all to the words on the slide. Does someone want to take a stab at uh, writing an assertion out in chat for this slide? How would what, what would your headline be for this slide? Yeah, put the ask first. What is it? 
right? Work, work with Bain to increase profitability by X or to optimize your operations through X, right? Like there's no clear ask. It's not client focused. And right, if, for example, if, I, if I'm not coming to Bain for help on a, on a private equity deal, I don't know why bullet point three needs to be in the slide, right? Like there are some things that may not be relevant here, right? It's just a, a legacy slide that's slapped on the front of every single pitch deck. So we don't have to go and do the work again and again, right? And so pyramid principle, right, requires us to take a little bit more of a curated and tailored approach. And while overall it will speed up our, our deck creation process, it may take us a little bit more work up front to get to that point. So uh, we don't want to sugarcoat this. Uh, it may take a little bit more time up front, but it's going to save you 10x the time on the back end as you actually build your slides. Good. Uh, love the feedback. Love the comments that are coming through. Uh, let's move on to, to meetings more specifically. And, and here's kind of our, our rule. Uh, well, I'll say this. It's my rule when I meet with folks on our team one-on-one. -on -one. OK, right. Here's what happens in a lot of meetings. And, and maybe this happens to you. Maybe you do this. Right. But you come to a meeting and you talk about what you've been doing. Right. And then you at the end, you ask your supervisor, you ask the team, well, what are we going to do about that? Right. Here's what a, a pyramid principle meeting looks like. And Stephanie already alluded to this is you come with your recommended action or takeaway. Right. Like based on the knowledge that I have, based on what I've seen, based on uh, right, this circumstance, right, this challenge, here's what I think needs to happen and here's why, right? And this is the action that I want to get approval for inside of this meeting. This is the action I want to align on inside of this meeting, right? Then we can discuss, okay, well, from my perspective, that doesn't make sense and here's why, or, you know what, you're missing this, um, or, you know what, let's tweak that a little bit, Right, but you come with a proposed action. You come with the reasons why that should be what you, the team, the organization does. And you think ahead and think, okay, if this is approved, here's what next steps would look like. Right, Japheth would own this and I would need him to do it by next Friday. Stephanie would own this and, and I would ask her to do this by Wednesday. And I would own this and I would wanna do this by Tuesday. Right, and you've already thinking ahead, okay, if my proposed action is accepted, here's what next steps look like coming out of the meeting. Here's what that does. It actually makes your meetings meaningful because you are talking about not just process or challenges, but you're discussing and debating ideas and, and action actions. And then you are ending with next steps, right? And that's really what you want to come out of every single meeting is next steps, right? I don't want to be in a 15 minute meeting or a 30 minute meeting and then have to join another meeting two days later to actually decide to, what to do based on what we discussed in the last meeting. I want to. I want everyone to come prepared. I want everyone to come with a hypothesis. I want everyone to have thought through things. And then I want to align on one set of already, or excuse me, on one set of next steps, whether they're yours or someone else's who came to the meeting. But that is the pyramid principle approach here to effective meetings, right? Your assertion becomes the action that you're proposing, right? And then you're going to defend that with three-ish reasons, and then you're going to think about the next steps that will come out of, of that uh, proposal if it were accepted. Uh, and that's how to make your meetings meaningful and actually talk about the things that matter and then not have to have another meeting about it. But so everybody actually knows what they're supposed to do at the end of that particular meeting. Some tactics to do this, right? Stephanie already mentioned this. Send your, your proposed action, your reasons ahead of like out ahead of time in an email, in a pre-read, uh, in a calendar invite. Um, ask others to do the same so you can prepare, uh, right? Again, it takes a little bit more time up front, but it's going to save you, what, five meetings a week, five follow-ups a week that didn't need to happen. Uh, you're going to get to next steps faster. People are going to be clear on their roles, their responsibilities, what they're being asked to do. You, there's going to be alignment on those things. Uh, those are the results that we see in the, I don't know, 250 organizations we work with now and, and train on the primary principle is, is that, right? They bring us in to, to do the training because it, makes them clearer and more effective communicators, but it also saves them hundreds of hours a year <laughs> in wasted meetings. One of the other ways that you can kind of prepare for a meeting is to build a storyboard, right? So if, if you want to, right, kind of use this as an exercise, right? You can, you can take a screenshot of this, you can build your own, but you can, you can build a storyboard to just 
map your own thoughts out, map out kind of your, your flow, right? And you, you start with your assertion on the left-hand side. We've got a sample one here, right? That we were actually worked on uh, with an actual client. That team's recommendation was that, hey, leadership, you should spend $2 million on paid media to reach 10 million engaged readers, right? There's a clear what and a clear why. It's under 10 words, right? It took us months to get there, but we finally got there. Uh, that was really the request. That was really what was needed, right? And so before we, we built out the meeting agenda, before we built out uh, the presentation, we started with that assertion. And then we thought, okay, what are the arguments? What are the reasons why that we want to include in this discussion and this conversation? right? You can input them into your storyboard. Okay. Is, is there some data that backs that up? Do I have one or two pieces of data that reinforces that? Great. Let me just put them on my storyboard and this can become your meeting agenda, right? Hey, hey y'all, this is, this is what I want to talk about today, right? Here's the one, here's the one thing I want us to all take away from today. Here's what I want to align on. Here's why let's discuss if we can do that. Right. And so building a storyboard is another way that you can keep focus inside of a meeting and align everybody around the key takeaway that you're looking for them to, to get out of it. Uh, Stephanie, anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I mean, the, the your first question is, do I need a meeting, right? Which is, um, for those of us who, you know, just have on our Outlook calendar, meeting after meeting after meeting and all these standing meetings, then for each and every time that you have something scheduled on your calendar, especially for the meetings that you own, you got to think about what do I need to get out of this time? Um, update meetings are the bane of most people's existence, right? And in, in the corporate world, um, anytime that you are sitting in an update meeting or that you're tasked with leading an update meeting, you've got to ask the so what question. Um, I don't just want to have this bottoms up conversation where I'm saying, here's all the things that we've been doing and here's everything that we've been figuring out. And, it, you know, it, I, and then I wait for the, for the conclusion for the very end of the meeting flip it on its head. What is the, what's the main takeaway? What's the main takeaway that you need to share with this specific audience uh, from the work that you've been doing? Um, and then you, maybe you selectively share some of the specific elements of what's been going on. That's that curated process. I'm going to, I'm going to pick out the main point of what I need my audience to believe and, or what I need them to do. I'm going to selectively back that up with uh, with key data points, and then I'm going to open it up for questions and maybe end the, end the meeting early. Or I'm going to decide perhaps that I'm going to try and do that now moving forward through an email and take time off of everybody's calendar. If I can clearly write a top-down pyramid principle email, then I can take meeting time off of the calendar in some corporate cultures, in some instances. Um, it's all about drawing out the so what, and yes, it, you're best served by being able to, to think ahead and plan and prepare for that meeting. But even if you're pulled into that meeting at the last second, I've, I've got to be thinking um, and I've got to be asking the question of, you know, kind of what, 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 were, what are the conclusions that you came to here? You know, what, what's the impact for us right now in the business? What's the impact for us in this task force and this group with our project? Um, and try and draw out those conclusions and main points, even when you're not the one leading. And when you are the one leading, now you're armed with this, this new tool and information to, to try and put into practice, have that top-down pyramid principle approach. And a totally acceptable assertion is everything is fine. Leave me alone. No, you're going to communicate that a little bit differently, but if it's an update meeting, right, that's a totally acceptable assertion to start with. And here's why everything's fine. Here's why we don't need to meet for 30 minutes this week, right? Like everything is moving ahead on schedule as it was supposed to be. And we can just check in again next week, right? So that's a totally okay assertion to make uh, as well. Like we don't need this meeting could be an assertion. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about emails here because uh, this is, we write, write way more emails than we have meetings and we write way more emails than we create presentations. Uh, and so receiving a non-pyramid principle email actually is the bane of my existence even more than the meetings, honestly. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we all know what the common approach looks like. I'm not going to break that down, right? It's just, you write everything you want to say. There's no clear takeaway at the, at the very beginning. Too long, right? Uh, especially when it's sent to a group of people. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it right? Like where's the assignment of action or the, like who's going to, supposed to respond to it? Um, they end with questions, right? Like it's just a whole bunch of uh, nonsense. If you ask me, uh, here's what a pyramid principle email begins with. 
you know, an action in the very first line. But if you want to start with a little bit of small talk or, or politeness, like that's fine, right? Hey, I hope you're having a great day. Hope you're well. Like that's fine, right? But very soon after that, the action. Here's why I'm writing this to you. I, I Stephanie, I, I need you to review this deck by Thursday at four o'clock, like before our seven o'clock session tonight, right? Or Japheth, I, I need you to, to do this, please, by Friday at 5 p.m. And here's why it's important enough for you to actually do it by that time, right? Three bullet points. Again, I'm using three as kind of this, our operating best practice. Uh, but here's why this is important for you to do. Here's why I need it. Here's how it's going to impact the business, right? And then setting the next steps, right? Hey, can you can you upload that to our shared drive again by Friday by 5 p.m.? Or can you send that back to me again by Friday at 5 p.m.? At right, Naman, like that's it, right? Like that that's the email. Like the goal is to get someone to agree with what I'm asking them to do or believe. And then after that, the goal is to actually get them to, to do it, to motivate action. That's it, all right? And if you don't have one of these three reasons to write an email, then I would question whether you have to write an email at all. And here are the three reasons. Number one, you wanna drive immediate action. That's the example I just walked through, okay? Number two, if you can't drive immediate action within two to three kind of responses, then you can set up a meeting. The, the key takeaway, the assertion becomes of that email, hey, can we chat for five minutes, like tomorrow at 2.30, so we can discuss X, Y, Z. Here's why it's important for us to discuss it before the weekend, right? So if you need kind of broader input, if you need something that can't just be actioned from an email, then you set up a, a quick meeting, all right? The third reason to write an email, again, is to build trust to be left alone. Right. And for those of us who have to write update emails, right, this this really is for us, you know, hey, boss, right. Everything this week is going according to plan. Like I hit these milestones. Right. This is what we accomplished. Right. Key takeaway. Like we're on track to complete this project, hit this goal by the end of Q1. Right. A couple of data points and a bullet point underneath. Right. Let me know if you want to chat about it. Otherwise, I'll check in with you next week. Right. And you're just building trust right? Because you're not ghosting a supervisor. You're not trying to run away from accountability, uh, but you are, right, communicating clearly and hopefully, like Stephanie said, saving time on both of y'all's calendars by just sending a very quick, concise update email that somebody can open, digest, and say, okay, great, I'm, I'm done with that. One of the things that, that we recommend to a lot of the organizations that we work with is to develop an email code that goes in the subject line. Right. And, and a, a quick code could just be right. And an email subject that has an A and a colon um, before the subject line is an action oriented email. And then an email subject line that starts with an I and a colon is an informational email. Right. So as folks are having their inboxes flooded every single day, right, seeing the A and the I will help them triage. Right. And so I'll open the A emails first, the action emails first. And maybe at the end of the day, I'll go through and read all of my I emails at that time. Right. But it helps, right? It helps folks again focus on what's most important and, and helps your message be received in the way that you want it to be received. And next week we'll we'll review a terrible email together. We'll rewrite our own emails, uh, right? Ones that you're actually working on right now. Uh, and, and we'll dive a whole lot deeper into primary principle presentations, meetings, and, and emails next week. But for now, just got a couple more questions for you before we let you turn the tables on us and, and ask us questions. Uh, and uh, we'll stick around as long as you have questions, right? So uh, either Stephanie or I or both of us will be here until the last person decides to drop. Uh, we're, we'll answer all the questions you have. So don't worry about the, the time. So, but let me ask you this first, right? Based on today, where do you, where do you feel like you need to get better? Is it, is it the same area that you thought it was at the beginning of the hour? And just pop this into chat. Right, just just type in a, a P and M or an E for presentations, meetings, or emails. I'm just curious, kind of what the what the consensus is here. All right, we got a, a few early votes for for meetings. P and M, Sam's cheating. I love it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yep. Presentations and meetings. Okay. All right. Great. So it looks like most of us still feel like, okay, meetings are something we have to work on. Hopefully we gave you some actionable tips uh, today to, to speed the meetings up, to make them more effective, and hopefully 
have you do less of them or take part in less of them as you move forward. Uh, we're going to do uh, a whole lot, whole lot more on meetings next week, uh, but hopefully this gave you some, some actionable uh, tips and, and strategies to take away. Here's our key takeaway, okay? Right, captivating your audience, being a, a pyramid principal communicator, a, a structured thinker requires a change of, of mindset. All right, so this is not just a skill, it's a mindset shift to be hypothesis driven, to be assertion driven. Uh, and so give yourself some time uh, to really internalize this. And one of the ways that, that I recommend people start is, you know what, just one email, right? One email in a pyramid principle way, right? Uh, one meeting agenda, structure it in a pyramid principle fashion by starting with the assertion. Like if you're not using executive summaries right now in your presentations, don't start by restructuring the whole presentation. Just start by building an executive summary. Start small uh, and can start to build momentum uh, as you internalize the pyramid principle and, and you'll start to see the fruit of it and that'll encourage you to keep going. But uh, I hope that some of you, you're halfway through writing an email this week and you, all of a sudden it hits you, oh my gosh, this isn't pyramid principle, right? And I hope that you go back and rewrite it. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that our voices will kind of be the pests in your mind a little bit uh, to, to help you start to become a, a clearer uh, communicator, a more effective communicator and ultimately a more influential professional. So uh, we'll share a quick takeaway through email uh, after this session so you have something to reference. Uh, so keep an eye on your inbox for that. Uh, and again, join us for next week's group training. Uh, what we're gonna be doing is you sign up is we're gonna be reaching out. We're gonna be asking you for kind of work examples uh, that you're working on right now. And if you are willing to share those with, share those with us, we will workshop those with you during next week's session. So, uh, Pretty much if you want Stephanie and I to help you do your job, that's what next week is for. <laughs> and so we're gonna be working through your emails, your presentations, your meeting agendas, uh, and we're gonna be diving a whole heck of a lot deeper into all of these aspects. Uh, Wednesday session is gonna be focused on assertions and arguments uh, primarily because all of us already live on the data layer of the primary principle. We need help coming up. Uh, and so we're gonna be spending a good 90 minutes on assertions and a good 90 minutes just on arguments. Uh, instead of 60 minutes on the whole thing like we did tonight. So it's going to be a deep dive. Uh, and again, if you want to join us, you get 100 bucks off just for, for hanging out with us tonight. Coupon code's in the chat. Uh, and so we'd love to have you join us. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of Strategy Simplified. If you like what you heard, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And don't forget to join us this upcoming Wednesday for our Impactful Communication Bootcamp. There are still a few spots left. You can learn more and grab a ticket through the link in the show notes. We'll see you next week.